Matthews, gained his PhD in geography from Indiana University in Bloomington. His research focuses on changes in the past climate record and how these changes influence force and society. He's especially interested in using past climate dynamics to inform and place modern changes of climate into historical context. This is typically done using a combination of tree rings and instrumental data. Further research interests include utilizing new species of dendrochronology and the cellular examination of wood anatomy. Ongoing projects include a thousand year reconstruction from tree rings of the North American monsoon and a reconstruction of snowpack of the Sierra Nevada mountains. He is the director of the newly formed Cal Dendro Laboratory at Cal State Fullerton. He teaches introduction to physical geography, weather and climate, mountain field geography, global climate change, and graduate physical geography in the Department of Geography and the Geography and the Environment at Cal State Fullerton. So please let's welcome Travis Matthews. <laughs> Can, can you guys hear me? Okay, great. Uh, so, uh, as Jana said, my name is Travis Matthews. My parents decided to spell both my names um, instead of just one. Uh, so, today I'll be kind of presenting a uh, sampler platter of all of the research that I've been conducting over the last few years and then uh, the research that I'm, I'm starting to get ramped up here with the newly formed Caldendro Lab. Uh, like Jana said, my uh, research interests include anything from meteorology all the way through to uh, climate change. Uh, and so it's kind of a little bit of everything. And so at the end, if you have any sort of general questions or things like that, I'd be more than happy to answer them. Uh, but like I said, I'll go ahead and get started with uh, the research that I've been doing with, with uh, in the Southwest and the research that I've been continuing with my students here uh, from Cal State Fullerton. So uh, a little bit of background as to where we'll be planning on heading. Uh, I want to talk about droughts in general, which I'm sure you're all very familiar with, uh, and then move on to what, what is dendrochronology, right? I realize that's uh, not very specific, and uh, maybe I'll define that a little bit better for you. And then talk a little bit about my research um, relating to specific tree species and, and, like I said, ongoing research here in the Sierra Nevadas. Uh, so the, the point that I'm trying to get across with the drought pictures are that we're all very familiar with droughts here in Southern California. Uh, where I was located before, when I first moved to Indiana in 2012, I got out there and they said they were in the worst of one of their, um, midst of one of their worst droughts. And I got there and I kind of laughed because it's Indiana, it was raining every day and just, I was like, well, what do you mean a drought? Uh, so here we all know about droughts, but my point is that Droughts vary depending on where you're at, and we can define droughts many different ways. And so we can look at a hydrological drought, which is just looking at the amount of actual precipitation um, that's falling from the sky. We can look at uh, an agricultural drought, which is we're talking about more uh, soil moisture and things like that. Um, and so here in California, I think looking at uh, soil moisture is probably a little bit more important um, based off crops and things like that, right? And so uh, this is the uh, U.S. Drought Monitor. This is from March 10th, 2015. So this was the height or sort of the peak of our last drought. And so we can see much of the southwest United States was in, in engulfed in this drought. Um, and we felt it particularly hard here in California. Uh, moving forward a little bit, um, this was last year this time. Um, so it's March 13th, 2018. And so even though we all kind of thought we were out of the drought with the 2016-2017 uh, large snowpack, um, the effects of the drought were still being felt in the soil moisture. And so that drought sort of st stuck around for a long time. And so, like I said, this was March 2018. So you can still see much of California is in this category of uh, moderate to severe drought, um, even though we all thought we were out of a drought. Uh, so this is sort of an ongoing issue here in Southern California, drought. So something that we need to kind of learn to live with. Um, looking at our most recent, this is from March 5th. They do them every two weeks or so, um, 2019, so just last week. Uh, we can see that with all of the atmospheric river precipitation, uh, much of California has actually officially came out of a drought, um, while the southernmost part of the state is still in this abnormally dry sort of state here. So these droughts can be very long-lived, and this is one area that my research is really interested in, is looking at droughts, looking at the long-term impacts of these droughts. 
Um, and tree rings specifically are very, very useful for this. Uh, my area of specialty is, is dendroclimatology, um, but that falls within the wider umbrella of dendrochronology. So dendro meaning tree, chronology meaning time. So um, sort of tr dating using trees. Uh, and so we can actually break off a bunch of different sub-disciplines within dendrochronology. So some work that I've been associated with is dating actual structures. Um, tree rings are really great for that. Um, looking at dendrogeomorphology, which is looking at avalanche paths, paths in northern New Mexico. Um, but like I said, dendroclimatology is sort of my main discipline, and so most of my research is in that field. Um, tree rings are really, really useful for dating, um, as they are our um, most temporally precise proxy method. So we can use them to represent snowfall, um, rainfall, uh, hurricane seasons, El Nino, um, going back much further than the instrument records that we currently have. So our instrument records go back reliably to about 1895 or so, uh, which seems like a long time, um, but as we know, the human lifespan, that seems like a long time. But if we look at the overall picture of, of climate and, and time, 120 years or so isn't really that long. Uh, and so tree rings are, do a really good job of going back 1,000 to 2,000 years or so um, and being annually dated. So we're very precise. We can say what the rainfall was like for the year 1590 um, or further back. Um, and so that's where tree rings really shine. And that's also where they come into that dendroarchaeology that I mentioned before. We can date structures to the nearest year. And so reconstructions here in the Southwest and even in California aren't necessarily a new thing. One of the earliest reconstructions of precipitation using redwoods outside of Fresno um, dates back to 1920. And so these have been, been around for a while, uh, but more recently, um, pushing out, we've been, been pushing further back in time. This earliest paper was uh, authored by sort of the discipline of our field, Andrew E. Douglas. I like to talk about him because his story is kind of fascinating. He moved to the Southwest um, in Northern Arizona. He's an astronomer and set up Lowell Observatory in Flagstaff, if you're at all familiar with that. And the legend is that on his lunch break, he was sitting there on a pile of ponderosa logs and you know, eating his ham sandwich or whatever and notice that the rings in the trees all sort of corresponded. So where there was a fat ring in the tree, all of the trees had a fat ring. And where there was a thin ring in the tree, all of the trees had a thinner ring. Um, and so this sort of really kicked off dendrochronology here in the Southwest, and he sort of transitioned his research. Um, this story really hits home for me because in my undergraduate career, I started out in space physics. And uh, I realized it was just way too abstract for me. Um, and so I, I like to think that I'm sort of following in the footsteps of Andrew Douglas. So since then, we've really, the, the discipline has really blossomed. Uh, and so precipitation reconstructions throughout the Southwest um, are not a new thing. And one of the major things about, um, that we've sort of been pushing back is, is further and further back in time, looking at tree ring reconstructions going back um, over 2,000 years here in this reconstruction in New Mexico, and, and ranging from anywhere from Colorado all the way from Alaska down to uh, you know, the Baja. Um, and so the area has been sampled quite a bit. Where uh, my research starts to come in now is I, I talked about uh, tree rings being one of the most precise annually dated proxy methods. Um, it turns out we can actually get more precise than that. So when we're talking about ice cores or things like that, they can go back, um, you know, the, the most recent one from Antarctica, over two, two million years. Um, sediment samples can go back millions of years further than that. And so time scale wise, tree rings don't really shine. 2,000 years isn't that long. But again, that annual dating. Now we're, we're pushing into the sub-annual dating, and so we can actually split the year into a uh, warm and a cool season, or a wet and a dry season. So we can look at uh, winter precipitation and summer precipitation is really what it boils down to. So we're, we're, we're able to hone in and become even more uh, precise with our dating. Um, and these are, are covering everything from uh, El Nino Southern um, Oscillation uh, to the North American Monsoon, which is one area that I'll be presenting a little bit on today. And we do this by looking at the actual patterns on the rings. So uh, you're all probably familiar with what a tree ring looks like. You've all probably seen a stump cut down or something like that. What most people don't realize is there's actually two bands and there's two rings in each year. So uh, with a given ring um, for a given year, we have the early wood, which is this lighter colored. I realize it's kind of hard to see with the lights, but you can kind of see this lighter band here. Um, I've got some show and tell kind of examples you guys can all kind of come and see. I was going to pass them around, but you guys are all spread out. So after the, afterwards, you guys can come check them out if you'd like. Um, and then we can see kind of this darker band here. 
And when we combine that early wood light band and that darker band, that's our total wood. So for, our, for a given year, we actually have two rings that are growing, two bands. And so oftentimes people will double count the rings and, and think the trees are twice as old in their yard when they cut them out, down than they actually are. Um, the reason that the tree grows like this is we have this early wood band, and that early wood band is uh, really light colored because the vessels are very large. And so that actually grows in the spring and corresponds to actually the previous year's October through the current year's April precipitation in most areas. Um, and the reason it's so light is it's really trying to pump out um, uh, water from the roots and nutrients from the roots and get a head start and start leaving out um, or, or developing more wood or pine needles and things like that. Versus later on in the season, this darker band typically corresponds to the uh, warm season, which is July through September. And uh, it's darker because the cell walls are thickening and it's uh, strengthening the tree for the coming winter. Um, the reason, it seems a little odd, like I said, this, this band corresponds to the previous year's October through the current year's April, um, but trees are mostly dormant in the winter, right? Um, the reason that it actually corresponds to that is because uh, the tree is responding to soil moisture that's stored up during the winter. So if it's a really, really wet winter or there's a large snowpack, there's a lot of moisture in the soil for that tree to grow from. And so we've actually found that it represents winter precipitation very well, even though the tree is dormant. So uh, not all trees exhibit this characteristic. One of the trees that uh, don't exhibit this is, is pinyon pines. Um, and they're very prevalent here in the Southwest. Um, we can see uh, from this pinyon pine that we don't have a very clear late wood and early wood band. We see this sort of line where that's darker, but we can't really tell where that starts. Um, but why do pinions matter? Um, I think they, they smell amazing. They're my favorite smelling tree, if you're interested. Um, also growing up, it's again, a hard, kind of hard to see. Uh, they make great Christmas trees, not really. They're, they're more bushy than they are tall. Um, so they're very bushy trees. Uh, I grew up in Northern Nevada, and so we would go out Christmas tree hunting, and we'd go out and collect these trees. Uh, but really, uh, they're, they're long lived and very widespread. Um, so they're all over the Southwest. Uh, the pinion juniper woodland um, counts, about, accounts for about 14.7 million hectares here in the southwest. That's about one and a half million hectares in California alone. That's roughly six times the area of Orange County. Um, I realize these numbers are kind of hard to wrap your mind around. Um, 3.6 million um, hectares in New Mexico. This makes up 21% of the total trees there and 53% of the uh, forested land there. Um, and so they're all over, they're very prevalent. If you've ever been um, up 395 through Owens Valley, you've probably seen them off the side of the road. They're these big scrubby, like I said, fat trees. Um, or you then all the way up into like Northern uh, California, Lassen County, the areas like that. Uh, so my uh, research for this particular study that I'm presenting is uh, focused in New Mexico. Uh, we sampled three sites, Turkey Springs, uh, Guyanese Mountains, and uh, Crowdcloth Low. This is down here by the Trinity testing site, actually. Um, and so we sampled uh, pinion pines and then co-occurring ponderosa pines. Ponderosa pines exhibit that very clear early wood, late wood boundary. Um, and they're growing together, they should be growing to the same um, precipitation or same climatological variables. So this gives us something to measure both of those and compare them and, and test our results and our methods. Um, I have a little short video here of what it looks like to actually sample the trees. So we use a handheld increment bore, which you can see in this video. So the bore is uh, twisted in the tree manually. It's basically a handheld drill. Um, I have one up here. It's hollow. It's got a uh, threaded tip on the end. It's very sharp. Um, and then it's got a uh, hollow interior. And then we have a spoon that we can actually insert into the tree, like you can see my graduate student here doing, um, and extract the core out of the tree. So uh, the next video here will show you what that looks like. So we insert the spoon, and then we can pull that spoon out of the core, and it brings the uh, out of the tree, and then that brings the core out with it. Um, and then we actually put those in basically soda straws, um, paper soda straws, and transport those back to the lab. Um, but from the uh, field, we can actually look at the uh, the cores and be able to tell uh, roughly how old the tree is in the field. Um, but then we need to come back to the actual lab and uh, process those. Uh, one of the reasons that I do this research is the field sampling sites are really terrible. Um, so you can see this site here in Sequoia, Kings Canyon, just positively miserable place to visit. Um, not very pretty at all. Um, last summer we sampled in Sequoia, and then Yosemite, this beautiful meadow, um, well off the beaten path, probably hasn't been seen by you know, tourist eyes in you know, hundreds of years. Just positively really terrible places to go. Um, but once we come back to the, uh, from the field, uh, we have a, a, a lot of work to do. So for every uh, hour that we spend in the field, um, this last summer we spent 10 days working about 8 to 10 hour days in the field. 
um, we have anywhere from five to eight hours of uh, sample preparation and measurements before we can actually get the raw data from the rings. Um, and so it's very uh, sort of uh, tedious. It's, 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 it's a lot of work. Uh, so what we can see here is we can see the core before. Um, you can kind of see some rings in there, but it's not very clear. We sand it with consecutively finer and finer sandpaper all the way down to 600 or micron grit, um, depending on the core. Um, and that really brings out the tree rings here. And so you can see these light and dark bands much clearer there. Um, and again, I have some sanded samples up here you guys can come check out. Um, the next step is actually physically measuring the rings. And so we use a uh, stand micrometer and a microscope to measure the rings. So uh, we use a stand micrometer accurate to a thousandth of a millimeter and you're, you're literally going through and you're measuring each of the rings by, um, by hand. Um, and the computer does a pretty good job. You just tap a button and it measures it. Um, so it's pretty quick. The problem is when we're measuring the rings, we have to measure the early wood and the late wood, right? In order for us to get any value out of that. Um, but with these pinion pines, you can't really see that early wood and late wood boundary. And I'm glad we turned down the lights because actually my whole presentation kind of hinges on this right now. Um, so uh, we can see this dark band here, but it's a very thin line, sometimes only a cell wall thickness. Um, and so there's not much to go off of there, but we know the tree um, has to exhibit and, and change the way it grows in order to support itself over the winter. And so what I started to notice, I originally wanted to focus on um, sort of a statistical analysis, um, splitting the rings in half, and then um, you know, sort of seeing how those represent the winter and the summer precipitation. But that doesn't really give us a variation for if we have a really wet winter, a very dry summer, and things like that. And so uh, it was around this time that I wound up going to a uh, Oh, I'm just getting ahead of myself a little bit. But like I said, we can't see that compared to this uh, ponderosa pine and this, uh, this ponderosa pine over here and this pinion ponderosa and Douglas pine over here. Um, and so it was around this time that I started to notice that in the ponderosa, of, God, man, the pinion pine, uh, that the uh, resin ducts occur roughly about where you'd expect the late wood to form. So if we can see these weird, big sort of crater features here, We'd expect to see those um, right about where the late would form. And if we look at this Douglas fir here, we can see these resin ducts forming again right where this late wood forms, the beginning of the late wood. And then if we look at this picture, it's got a little bit of sawdust on it. It's a scanned image from an actual sample. We can see the resin ducts forming again right about the beginning of this late wood and early wood. Um, and it was around this time that I uh, actually took a class at, at Harvard. And it was on wood anatomy. And there's not too many places you can go to do that. And um, so I started to learn about the cellular development and the arrangement of these cells. And it turns out that it's uh, been known for quite a while um, that these resin ducts uh, form at the beginning of the, the, the late wood, between the early wood and the late wood. Um, but it's been since, sort of since the 60s that uh, the botanists have discovered this. And there's been this disconnect between botany and dendrochronology or botany and geography. And so this method's never been really looked at with a sort of a geography or a dendrochronology lens. And so it was kind of cool to apply that. And lo and behold, I didn't even realize it until I got back. The textbook that we were actually using at, for that class set it in the textbook. Um, and so it was sort of right there, sort of staring me in the face. I thought I discovered something amazing, but really it was just sort of rediscovering something. Um, and so I developed this method to measure this early wood and late wood based off of that. And so we can kind of see these resin ducts here. I've pointed out the first occurring resin duct in the tree ring each, for each year. And we're using that to basically just draw a parallel line to the late wood band that exists. And so then that gives us this area would be our late wood. This next area here would be the early wood of the next year, the late wood. And I've kind of pointed out the resin ducts and then the lines that correspond to the early wood and late wood growth here. Um, and that gives us a reference point. Unfortunately, not all of the trees exhibit um, resin ducts but, uh, for a given year. But one tree might have a resin duct for that year. So by the time we average everything together, it sort of squashes out that data that's missing. The next step in training analysis, whether or not you can measure the early wood or the late wood, is to actually cross-date the trees. Um, and so this is sort of the linchpin. This is the most important part of tree ring dating, because this is the part that allows us to say with statistical certainty that a given ring corresponds to a given year. Um, and so this is sort of where the discipline hinges on. And so what this does visually looking at this is we can look at the year here of uh, uh, I believe this is 1670, and we can see the year 1670 is really thin. Um, and so these are the dots. We put a dot for each, uh, each decade, and we can see 1670 is thin throughout all of the trees. 
Um, we can see the year 1680 is fat throughout all of the tree course. And then if we look at the year 1690, we can see it's in the middle of a bunch of smaller rings. Um, and so what we do is a uh, uh, moving window correlation analysis where we look at 10 years and we correlate that to 10 years throughout the trees. If the rings are thin or missing in that area throughout the trees, then it gives us an idea of some statistical certainty as to where, uh, whether or not we've dated the rings properly. But this is what it looks like sort of by, you know, visually. The next step here in the Southwest is to remove the biological growth trend. So in the Southwest, uh, we've all probably hopefully been out and seen trees, right? Um, we have this real open canopy growth. And so trees aren't really competing for sunlight. And as a result, um, the trees have this negative exponential growth trend. Um, so this is tree, raw tree ring widths. Um, but the tree grows much thicker earlier on in its year because of uh, just the simple logistics of transporting nutrients over a smaller area. Um, and then as the tree grows, it's going to put on a bigger ring, so it's bigger in diameter, but a thinner width. Um, and so it might be the same area across that entire diameter of the tree, but it's a thinner width because the tree has grown so big. Um, and so the, what winds up happening is we see this negative exponential growth trend, this biological trend that we need to remove to then isolate the climate data. And so we can kind of see um, once that's detrended, we can see the climate data. And then the next step, like I said, is to, to average all of the cores together for a given site to give us one um, data set to represent a, a region. Um, okay, so I don't want to get too bogged down in the numbers here, but we can basically, we're comparing the um, the correlation value between the early wood and the late wood and then the total ring widths, um, so how well the trees are green growth-wise, um, between the ponderosa pine and the pinyon pine. And we can see that they correlate quite highly, um, and all of these numbers are uh, significant. So we can see that the uh, early wood and the late wood um, agree between the two trees, basically. Um, and then if we look at uh, standardized precipitation index, which is a better value of uh, soil moisture, um, and kind of averaged over time. It, it, it doesn't have as much memory effects as, as raw precipitation. Um, this is the important thing because this determines whether or not this method will work or whether or not we can use pinion pine specifically to look at that warm and that cool season precipitation. And what we can see right away is uh, every other row, this PIPO, that's the ponderosa pine um, at each site. And then the PIED is the pinus edilis, which is the pinion pine um, at each site. And we can see that the ponderosa pine, which has been used for early wood and late wood, warm and cool season reconstructions, represents um, SPI relatively well. Um, it statistically correlates um, significantly with each of the uh, cool and the warm season. Um, but the pinion pine only correlates well with the cool season. Um, and so all of the correlation values for the warm season, which is what I was hoping to use these for, the, those afternoon thunderstorms, the North American monsoon in New Mexico, Turns out you can't use the pinion pine for that. However, we can use it to look at winter precipitation. Um, in some cases, it represents winter precipitation much better than the ponderosa pine. So even though I wasn't able to use them for what I was intending to use them for, the, uh, the results are still pretty useful. So uh, kind of in summary, uh, the resin duct method um, represents uh, tree growth pretty well accurately as far as the lightwood and the early wood goes. However, pinion pines cannot be used um, for these cool season reconstructions. Um, and it has a very, I'm sorry, it can be used for cool season reconstruction. It has a very strong signal, but it has a very weak warm season um, signal. Uh, so what does this, why, why does this even matter, um, I guess, is, is, is the big thing. So these trees are all over the Southwest. Um, droughts are expected to become um, more prevalent in the future, um, especially here in Southern California. We're already seeing that this last drought was particularly devastating. As temperatures continue to go up, um, it, it, when we do get a drought, it's going to be more severe because it's hotter. And so we have more water evaporating, um, which stresses plants, stre stresses crops and things like that. And so I always say it's tough to know where we're going if we don't know where we've been. And so being able to look back and give us a context of what we can expect for extreme droughts and things like that over a 2,000 or 1,000 year period here in Southern California or California in general is going to be very useful for giving us a, a reference point for future droughts, right? Um, and again, like I said, we only have about 120 years of data, which seems like a long time, but really isn't enough. Uh, so in order to extend this sort of ongoing studies, um, of course, I'd like to use pinions to look at cool season and look at pinions because even though uh, Primarily, most of New Mexico's precipitation occurs in the summertime. If we move up northern to northern latitudes, more of the precipitation occurs in the wintertime. And so pinions can really excel to that. Uh, but one of the areas that I'm looking at sort of building and expanding out and wrapping up my research um, in the New Mexico region 
um, is to look at uh, these sort of long series um, by taking uh, dead wood that's been laying out in lava flows or on scree slopes, so it's hard to burn. So it could be laying there for several hundred years, um, just weathering away. Um, and then we can overlap that with that cross-dating method that I showed you. And so we can basically match the patterns of the living trees with the dead trees and extend the record back in time. And so we're, uh, we're doing this with uh, ponderosa pine um, and Douglas fir in uh, New Mexico. And so far we've been able to go back uh, roughly 1,500 years. So this gives us 1,500 years of subannual precipitation data for the state of New Mexico, um, which is really, really long-lived data. Um, and I have some of these uh, samples up here, like I said, if you want to look at them, um, of a pinion pine, and this one's actually a uh, um, juniper. Um, and so, like I said, we basically can overlap these patterns of these living trees with, let's say, a stump or something like that, or even um, uh, Native American Puebloan ruins um, or, or dead cores that have been, or dead trees that have been laying around for a long time on lava flows and things like that. Overlap these patterns and extend the record further back in time. Uh, so this is what that looks like um, in New Mexico. So this is uh, roughly uh, 800, I'm sorry, goes back to roughly the year 850. So about 1,200 years worth of uh, tree ring widths for the state. This is uh, relatively hot off the press. Um, so this is, uh, I haven't done a, a reconstruction yet, uh, but the widths correlate well with the uh, precipitation in the state. And so we can see these periods of sort of prolonged droughts um, in the record here. So we can see these periods where uh, we have very dry years. This is uh, looking at the uh, total width on the top, um, and then we have the early wood and then the late wood here. Um, and so again, like in, in the state of New Mexico, 50% to 60% of the precipitation is represented in the summertime precipitation of that monsoon. And so we're looking at that summer drought here. And we can see this period of uh, a couple hundred years um, known as the uh, uh, mega drought. We also see this in California, about 120 year drought in the 1600s. Um, and so when we're looking at you know, our last drought of four or five years, um, if we think about that drought spanned out over the course of 120 years, it could be a lot more devastating. And so this is really where we get that, that strength of looking at the past to be able to tell where we're going. Um, and so the idea is to, to combine my research in New Mexico with existing tree rings that have already been sampled in Arizona, um, Southern Utah, Southern California, and Southern um, Nevada and be able to create this sort of monsoon network of precipitation throughout the region. Um, and this will give us a better idea of what we can expect. One of the things with having a high density network, one of the, the fun things about that, is being able to look at patterns. And so what I would like to do is be able to contour years and be able to look at where droughts start and end or look at the beginning of that uh, North American monsoon mega drought um, in the 1600s and sort of look at how that spreads and moves through an area and having a high density network in that area is very useful. Um, so that's sort of wrapping up my research before I got here. And so like I said, it takes a long time to get this through the hopper, um, anywhere from five to eight hours for every hour that we spend in the field. So it takes a long time. Um, looking at more Southern California or more California in general, um, I'm particularly interested in these uh, sugar pine trees. Um, sugar pines uh, are, account for roughly 10% of all of the trees in the Sierra Nevada range having a diameter of uh, 40 inches or more. So they're very, very prevalent. Um, one of the kind of a fun trivia facts about sugar pines is they actually have the world's longest pine cones. This is kind of a small one. Um, they can grow up to 33 inches. Um, and so they're, when I came here for my job interview, it was funny, we have a botanist in our department and uh, I said that they were the world's largest pine cones. And I guess that's kind of technically wrong. Um, they're the world's longest. Here in Southern California, we have the culture pine, which is the world's largest by weight. Um, they can get up to, um, I think 20 pounds or more when they're wet. Um, they're called widow makers because they can, you know, kind of clobber you in the head. It's funny when you go to try to find these out there, you have to find it where it's landed on a, a plant or something and cushion its fall. Otherwise it flattens and leaves kind of a crater where it hits. Um, but so sugar pines are uh, the world's longest pine cones, but they're also very prevalent in the, uh, the Sierra Nevada mountains. Sugar pines actually uh, exhibit the same growth characteristics as those pinion pines. Um, so that method that I was talking about with the, the, the pinion pine can actually be applied to these sugar pines. And now all of a sudden we've unlocked a whole new species um, to be able to look at uh, early wood and late wood growth and warm and cool season. Um, which doesn't seem like too big of a deal until you connect the dots and realize that in California most of our precipitation or most of our water supply comes from snowpack. Um, and so being able to reconstruct and look at past snowpack is going to be a much better metric of uh, water security than looking at 
just soil moisture, which is what tree ring studies in the Sierras have done to this point. So we've collected several sites from uh, Sequoia and Yosemite, um, sugar pines, ponderosa pine, um, white pine is actually another uh, pine tree that doesn't exhibit the same growth characteristics. And so we can use the pinion pine method to uh, measure their wood and lightwood. Um, and I'm doing this, um, of course, here at Cal State Fullerton with students. Um, and so I take students out in the field. I have a couple of students working on um, different theses related to this. Um, and so I've been trying to, trying to get as much student involvement as possible, so that's really important to me. Um, one of the sites in uh, Sequoia National Park, actually, we've, we sampled these foxtail pines. Um, they're uh, really long-lived. They're in the same family as the bristlecone pine. Bristlecone pine trees are the oldest pine trees on the planet, um, over 5,000 years old. Um, and so the foxtail pines can be extremely long-lived as well. This particular foxtail pine in Sequoia National Park is actually uh, dates back to the year 980. So that would make it uh, roughly 1,100 years old. Um, so really old trees. Um, and so that gives us already, without even having to look at uh, you know, these dead wood slabs and things like that, that gives us a thousand years worth of data, um, of potential snowpack data. Um, looking at sort of initial results from that, we can see that the trees from these sites, this is just looking at the uh, total ring widths um, because these were already available in previous studies. Um, and then we had to go back and resample them so we can measure that early wood and late wood. Um, we can see that it represents sort of the, um, I don't know, uh, California, Great Basin, uh, precipitation and snow really well. Um, and so as we sort of tease out that early wood and late wood signal, I expect this is only going to improve and represent um, the region much better. Uh, so that's all I have for you guys today. Um, I think it was a little bit short, um, so we'll go ahead and open up to questions. Uh, wow, uh, so I think it was the, the gentleman in the back. Yeah, yeah, so that was actually the student. I forgot to, to point that out. So. Uh, yeah, he asked, uh, in, in our early wood and late wood, uh, we represent October through April, and then July through September in the late wood. So we skip May and June. Um, and it's kind of a weird period related to New Mexico specifically, um, is that's actually sort of a second dry period. And so what happens is the trees will start to bud out and be really active with uh, winter precipitation, soil moisture. And then they kind of stop growing and go into a standby mode until the monsoon kicks in. And the monsoon typically kicks in around June. And so that's why we kind of skip that. We can't really represent that period very well, just because it's so dry. Excellent question. Yes, sir. Um, when you do your core or bore holes, they look to be like a centimeter or two. What happens afterwards? Is that damage to the tree, or somehow does it fill in? Or Excellent question. I intentionally don't talk about that in the slide, because I assume someone's going to ask it. Um, so I'm glad you asked that. Uh, so it's actually it's a, a five millimeter hole is the biggest hole that we make. Um, most of the co cores that I've been using lately are four millimeters, so even a little bit smaller. Uh, I'm sorry, the gentleman asked uh, if coring the tree hurts the trees uh, or what happens to the trees afterwards. And so it depends on the type of wood. So if we look at uh, conifers or softwood, conifers uh, do a really good job of uh, exuding sap. Um, and that same sap that's being transported by those resin ducts um, to help repair the tree. And so it acts as sort of a, a band-aid or a, you know, it's kind of neosporin um, and closes up that hole um, pretty quickly. And what we'll actually do is we'll cover these bore, increment bores with a fungicide too. Um, so trees can have uh, what's called heart rot. And that's really the only real thing that can kill a tree that isn't related to fire or pests, right? So trees can theoretically live forever if they don't burn, they don't get eaten by bugs, or they don't rot. And so the sap does a good job of preserving that, but potentially if one tree has um, fungus, you can transport fungus to another tree. Supposedly, there has not been any studies supporting this in any way, shape, or form, uh, but one of the things that we do is we coat each of the uh, borers with fungicide after we're done with each tree, just to prevent that potential from even happening. Um, so the softwood trees exude sap and close up that hole, no problem. Um, and like I said, it's one tiny little hole. Um, the hardwood trees actually do something that's, I think, more fascinating, so oaks and things like that, is they'll compress, and they'll immediately compress and close that hole while we're still coring it. So we'll core into the tree, and with the softwood, this, we can basically thread the bore in and out. With the hardwood, it compacts that hole, and we actually have to, when you're pulling the, the bore back out, you actually have to physically pull it back out, and so you're sort of re-threading that back through. It's an exercise that there's, I don't think there's any gym equivalent to get used to. It's brutal. <laughs> um, and so that's why part of my research started out in Indiana looking at oaks, and I've transitioned back to the, the southwest looking at pines. 
uh, much easier. But yeah, so, so the trees do a really good job of compartmentalizing that damage and they just keep growing. And, and the other thing with trees is that, that just that tiniest layer right inside the bark is the only part of the tree that's alive besides the bark. And so when we're coring through, we're really only affecting you know, a teeny tiny millimeter thick um, part of the tree that's alive. And then only in a small four millimeter diameter hole. So very little damage is done to the trees. Yes, sir. Have you been to the uh, Takati Cypress in Coal Canyon and the, uh, in the White Mountains, there's a tree, and I'm trying to think of it, and they're both ancient trees. There's yeah, so uh, the gentleman asked if I've been to uh, the uh, Takati Cypress and Coal Canyon, and then bristle cones in white, the White Mountains. Yeah, and so the bristle cones in the White Mountains are um, sort of, the, they're our oldest trees. So that's where that 5,000 plus year old tree is. Um, they named it Methuselah just because it was so old. They actually, um, they're kind of keeping it under wraps, but there's another tree that they found that's older than that tree. Um, it's named Prometheus. Um, and they're taking their time releasing the date of that tree. Um, so I have visited the uh, White Mountains. Just this last summer, I took that uh, field class that sampled the trees in Sequoia and Yosemite. We did kind of a loop up the uh, east side of the mountain, or the west side of the mountains, and then came back down the south side, down at Owens Valley, and went up there and checked out those trees. Um, they're really hard to get permission to core those trees just because they're so old. Um, and then I haven't made it out to, to, to Cotty Canyon to check out the cypress. Well, they burned over twice. <laughs> oh, really? And uh, the Forest Service went in and replanted and as you go up the road, you can see where, you know, they, when they plane the road, the stuff, well, see, it's come down and the trees were sprouting. The last time I was up there was about 10 years ago. Did, did any of the trees make it? Were there any of the older trees survive? Actions that burned the same. Yeah, you're mentioning the White Mountains, and I remember the sense of perspective visiting the White Mountains and seeing this stand of dead trees and yeah, learning yeah. that the they last look. stuff that died 2,000 years ago. Yeah. <laughs> just, just for perspective in our lifetime. Yeah. Yeah, and so that's, again, that's like I said, we, we, we oftentimes think that, you know, 100 years is a long time, or, or even in, in dendro archaeology terms, if we're dating a structure, what winds up happening is someone tells a story of like, my great, great, great grandfather built this hut or this, this, this cabin. And it turns out that was actually just your great great grandfather. And, and over the generation, you lose those greats. But being able to go through and look at that, you get a better perspective. Um, yeah, definitely. Was there a hand back there? This one, uh, Poppy, did you ever harvest the nuts for the pinions? <laughs> so she asked if I ever harvested the nuts for the, the pinions. Um, and uh, I have growing up, like I said, growing up in the Great Basin. Uh, we'd go out and we'd, we'd go Christmas tree um, sampling or cutting. Uh, we would go and collect the nuts or whatever, and, and it's funny coming from Indiana to go to New Mexico to sample. Um, pinion pines are called Pinus edulis because you can eat the nuts, um, and they're actually world renowned for their pine nuts. Um, and so, if you've never had a pinion pine nut, if you're ever going through like Flagstaff, Northern Arizona area, you can pick them up on the side of the road. Um, they're amazing. They taste fantastic. They're phenomenal. Great for cooking. Um, widely regarded internationally as some of the best pine nuts um, as far as as far as tasting goes. So, yeah. Um, changing the subject of climate, climate change, it's been uh, alleged that there's a crying need to pull carbon dioxide out of the air to mitigate the effects, and that trees do that. Do you subscribe to the idea that the growing of many millions more of trees would be a proper attempt, a partial attempt, to mitigate some of the effects of climate change? So the, the gentleman asked um, if planting millions more trees would help um, mitigate the effects of climate change and pull that carbon dioxide out of the air, um, correct? Uh, so it depends. So I look at trees as being a, a temporary carbon sink. Um, and so a lot of people don't realize that if in, in a given year, especially deciduous trees, um, they pull in a lot of carbon dioxide, but then they release a lot of carbon dioxide when their leaves fall back down. So they'll store that carbon dioxide in the wood and then eventually, you know, over the course of 100 years, 200 years, whatever, if that tree falls down or gets felled, then that, that stored carbon is then going to get re-released, right? Um, and so we have to have this continuous sort of healthy forest where we have um, an overflow of, you know, of young trees growing, we have older trees growing to continually sink carbon. Um, I actually just read a study this last weekend that was looking at um, the fact that trees can only take in so much carbon in a given year, right? And so the number of trees that we can physically plant 
um, is not enough to um, offset the amount of carbon dioxide emissions. Um, and so it could slow things, um, potentially, uh, but not quickly enough, I think, was, was the, the findings of the study. And I, I think I agree with that. And like I said, I look at trees as being sort of a temporary solution, um, temporary but long-term solution if we can sort of keep a healthy forest growing, right? Yeah. Excellent question. You want to explain those things on the table? Certainly. Uh, uh, so the gentleman asked if I wanted to explain these things on the table. Uh, so like I said, we have the uh, sugar pine cone here. This is a pretty small one that can get to about 30 inches or so. Um, and they're the world's longest pine cones. Uh, Coulter pine cone here are the world's largest by volume and weight pine cone. Um, you're welcome. What's that called? Coulter pine. Um, and Coulter pine is actually so, <laughs> LA Times had this article uh, about uh, how uh, the big cone Douglas fir should be Southern California's big tree claim to fame because palm trees aren't, aren't an indigenous tree, right? Um, and I kind of agree with that. The big cone fir is kind of cool. It's interesting. It's pine cones get about that big. Uh, I think the Coulter pine should be the Southern California's uh, tree and claim to fame. Um, so these are called Widowmakers. You can find them all over the eastern slopes of the uh, San Gabriel um, Mountains. Um, San Bernardino, no, most of San Gabriel. So just up in sort of LA uh, forest there, um, Los Angeles forest. Um, here we have a pinion pine cross section. Um, and so this is a pinion pine like we studied before. This pinion pine is about 500 years old to the innermost ring. Um, and the interesting thing with these two trees is you can see the outside here kind of looks like bark, uh, but actually that's just where the trees have been eroded or weathered away. The bark's not really remaining on these trees. Um, so that's what those are. And then I have, uh, and again, normally I pass these around, but you guys are so spread out. And there's so many of you. Um, I thought I'd just leave them up here. Um, this is a uh, oak uh, cores. Um, so these are two cores. We mount them on these wood, wood sections to help stabilize them and protect them. Um, so I have oak, I have uh, ponderosa pine, and then pinion pine up here if you guys would like to come take a look at them. And then uh, the increment bore here as well is how we sample the trees. And, and what's the small thing next to this? Oh. This is, so, so this is the actual physical bore. Um, so this is what we you know, manually turn into the tree. And then this is, I'm gonna put down the microphone. Um, I'll talk loud. The, uh, this, this is the spoon. So this is how we actually extract the core. So we, like in the video, we insert this into the core, uh, or into the bore, um, and then pull the core back out with this while this is still in the tree. And then we can take the sample and we, can, we put it in a uh, paper straw to preserve it and keep it together. And then we can bring those, all of those paper straws back to the site. So at a given uh, tree ring, at a given tree site, we try to sample 20 trees. Uh, we sample two cores, one on each side of the tree to uh, help if there's any asymmetric growth of the tree, uh, the tree's trying to hold itself up, or uh, sometimes it might be more rotten on one side or something like that. Um, and then we bring those back. And so this last summer we sampled four sites. So we had a total of 160 uh, core samples to, to process. And so we're, we're just getting through all of those. Yeah. In yes, the uh, mid 90s, we were looking for a place to retire up in Northern California. And the realtor we were talking to at Christmas time sent us these pine cones that were really long. And I don't know what, gave big around. And he baked them in the oven and they got a glisten to them. They were. Uh -huh. I guess the sap or whatever was in it created this shiny surface. Wow. Sent them to us for Christmas. What, where was that at? You know, I. You didn't retire there. <laughs> 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 it, was, it was near a famous lake, got a mountain bicyclist. I wanted to. I was envious of. I wanted to. Yeah, I suspect, g given your your description of the length and the diameter, they were they were probably uh, sugar pine cones. Um, so, like I said, this guy's a particular. This guy's a small, really small sugar pine cone. Um, they get to up to about you know 30 inches or so. Um, and certainly in places like Yosemite, you'll see them more often than not that big. Uh, the fun thing in Yosemite is the sugar pines grow co-occurring um, with the sequoias in the Sherman Grove. And one of my favorite things to do uh, is you're not supposed to take anything, anything from that grove. But you'll see tourists going through and picking up the sugar pine cones because they're like, big tree must have big cone, right? And they're picking up sugar pine cones. And so I wonder how many people go home and show off their sequoia pine cones, illegal sequoia pine cones, that are actually sugar pine cones. Because the sequoia pine cones are, I don't even know if you'd call them cones, they're more like a ball about that big. Yeah. I saw, I saw the, the, the ladies in the back's hands. You mentioned that the mega drought from the 16 minutes, right, um, through your research, you really see more of a difference than the rings and all. Can you 
Yeah, so uh, she, she asked about the sort of the predictive power of the tree rings research, right? Um, and so, especially looking at the mega drought, um, that's definitely something that's, that was discovered using tree rings. Um, and that was discovered actually here in California. Um, and that's uh, an abnormally dry period lasting more than 120 years. And so I was, again, like I always like to just drive that point home. Our last drought was four to five years. Can you imagine that lasting 120 years? Um, and, and one of the things that um, we, we can't do a lot of predictive power. Uh, but it gives us a reference point, right? So we know what temperatures would have been like from other tree ring studies and other studies. And so we can look at how severe that drought was. So if temperatures were cooler during the 1600s, which they were, and the drought was 120 years, which is a long period, the drought was longer lasting, but in many ways not as severe as our most, last, most recent drought. And so we had four years that were more severe than any of the four years in that 120 year period. And so that gives us sort of a context of, so now if we, have a, if we can think about a 120 year drought and wrap your mind, our minds around that, if, with the current warming trend, that's gonna stress the trees a lot more. And so it frames these things more than anything. Um, there is some potential to include tree ring data in modeling um, for future climate, but the problem with this is um, the models are looking more at current right now, right? Um, and if we push it forward, um, what that looks like. And so the tree rings having even annual resolution isn't precise enough. Um, so the biggest power for me is being able to frame things and look at things differently. Um, and so when we look at 2,000 years worth of uh, droughts and, and precipitation here in Southern California, or California as a whole, maybe we need to reframe what an actual drought is. So maybe what we have been experiencing since the 1900s has actually been one of the wettest periods so what we're considering a drought and during the last four years is actually probably closer to what average precipitation would be like for California. So maybe we need to redefine what a drought is um, and then sort of we can change policies and things based off of that. Um, and so that's, that's where I really see the strength of the trees coming in. Um, I worked with some climate modelers as far as looking at trying to, like I said, sort of nudge the models a certain way using tree rings. And that was uh, what they told me was, was tree rings were useful for, um, you know, context and useful for uh, looking at um, extremes, but not so useful for the models just because they're, they're too, even though they're our most precise proxy debt record, they're not resolved enough to be able to nudge the models in a certain direction. Thank you. Yeah. Is there being passed to your response by government agencies putting on climate change? Is my research being sponsored by government agencies? Or passed to government for agencies? for working on climate change. It is not, I would love to be sponsored. Uh, so, yeah, right? Uh, so my research in New Mexico was actually funded um, by uh, the, my co co colleagues at the time, um, and then a small grant from the University of Indiana. Um, fortunately, tree ring research is very uh, tractable. It's very easy to sort of scale up or scale down. Um, and so, um, you, I mean, I have some cars up here. I'm in the fourth floor of the Humanities and Social Sciences building. You can feel free to come by um, if you're ever there, um, or if you even just want to email me and schedule a visit, I can show you around the lab. Um, uh, but basically, it's I mean the same materials that you need for woodworking, um, so sanders, things like that. And so, so the startup costs aren't that expensive. It's the field work, you know, getting boots on the ground for 10 days, 12 days, and then feeding those people and getting them there. That's a little more expensive. Um, so for this last summer, I was able to do that in conjunction with a class. And so I took mountain field geography on a 10-day excursion. And we learned about you know, geomorphology, learned about tree growing. We even had one night where we looked at stars, someone brought a telescope. Um, and so we were able to do that because the class was funded from the uh, ASI. They have the um, instructional related activities. Um, and then our department kicked in a little bit of money to help fund that. And then I had a little bit of startup funds. But no, I'm not currently being supported um, in any way. Of course, I'm applying for grants and all of that. But they say you have to get a grant to get more grants. And it's like, well, how do I get that first grant? Um, and so that's what this uh, sort of uh, Sierra study looking at snowpack is hopefully a first stab looking at four or five sites to be able to uh, look at uh, how reliable is this for reconstructing snowpack. And if it is reliable for reconstructing snowpack, I, I feel like I can make a very strong case. And I feel like I've maybe made that already. That snowpack is where our water comes from. That's really what we care about, um, less so of precipitation. So if we can look at reconstructing 2,000 years of snowpack, that's gonna be very powerful. And so this is sort of my pilot study, my pilot data to hopefully get funding potentially. 
Do, do you have an endowment? Would you like to, to kick in? <laughs> I was just thinking as I listened and watched this, dendroclimate has a very different meaning for drought from the farmer. You think in terms of decades. The farmer thinks in terms of this planting season. Yeah, so uh, this is again, like when we talk about uh, droughts, we can define droughts differently. So, so uh, the gentleman brought up that uh, we have different time scales, right? So maybe in dendrochronology, I might think in decades um, or, uh, you know, versus the farmers actually maybe not even thinking about, you know, the year, but the actual, this season, this summer. Um, and that's actually kind of a, a fun thing. But in dendrochronology, I'm showing you the long-term droughts because they're more exciting to talk about. But we can definitely see those, those sub-annual, those, those single years. But they're a little less exciting to talk about, you know, as far as if we're talking about 2,000 years worth of data and we have a drought every five years, let's say, it's like, okay, well, it's, you know, we, you know, list the years. It's a lot to list, you know. Um, but it's actually kind of fun that you brought that up because um, my farming and my, my background, my family is actually farming. They uh, grow alfalfa and garlic in northern uh, uh, Nevada. And so that's always something that's fun to talk about with um, farmers in the area and things like that is, well, you know, this drought's been so bad or, and things like that. And it's like, well, it could be worse, you know. Yeah, yeah thank you. Thank you. All right. um,